people you are. You, your family, your colleagues are safe. And our uh, prayer would be stay safe, stay healthy. These are difficult times. But let's be optimist. This too shall pass soon. OK, having said that, let me again formally introduce the Tunneling Association of India to you. Uh, this is a body which was embodied in the year 1976. And uh, we work. Under the ages of Central Board of Irrigation and Power in India, and we've been associated with the ITA, the International Tunneling Association and Underground Space uh, right since our inception. The, the mission of our organization is like this, to get everybody on the same platform, our people from the academic background, our consultants, our industry partners, our builders, our equipment manufacturers, our material manufacturers, the, the students of tunneling, everyone together under one roof to discuss, to share, and also to plan. We do publish our technical publications and share with all. Uh, we are the official representatives of India in the ITA. So whatever events are held by the ITA, we represent uh, uh, India as a nation. Uh, in addition to that, once every two years, we do conduct Tunneling Asia. It's a major event. Last time we conducted it in Mumbai. Uh, this, this year, of course, it is not due. We'll see the next year and also do the Tunneling Asia Awards once in two years again. A uh, good part of our expansion has been that the young tunnels of uh, TAI is a new chapter which was added during last two last year, that is 2018. The young tunnels means those who are less than 35 years of age. Now that's our brief introduction and our activities that we undertake. We also have a sister organization which is very new, just a few weeks or a few months old called Center for Excellence for Tunnels. Uh, there's an organization in India called the National Highway Infrastructure Development Corporation Limited. They basically make highways. And they thought that OK, on the highways, uh, there is a there's a requirement of having large number of tunnels. So they made a small core group in their organization, <coughs> which is uh, in collaboration with us. And they are also looking at the thought leadership, the strategic advice and the problem solving uh, inputs. They are more on the practical side of it, and uh, the two organizations hopefully will collaborate and work together. So that's a brief introduction. <clears throat> Coming to the subject proper for the day, spray applied waterproofing membrane. So just see the word called spray applied waterproofing membrane. So there are three parts to it. One is uh, using spray. We The application is using spray. Second is that's a waterproofing uh, solution and third it's a membrane. OK, now uh, I will not go into too much of the chemical part of it. Uh, Master Seal 345 is the name of the product. It's a spray applied waterproofing membrane. It's a polymer based double bonded sprayable product. In a very simple term, it glues the two concrete surfaces together. It works more like a composite and those who are into the materials would also understand that when you think about composite materials, they got some amazing qualities, amazing properties. And the best is that they optimize. They are more durable and they are more cost effective. Same is the case with the Master Seal 345. It optimizes. It is more durable and it is cheaper in the long run. OK, and scientifically speaking, it's based upon laminate beam theory. We will learn more about it from our two experts on the panel today. Let me introduce the speakers to you. I briefly just spoke. Uh, Frank, you will have to come up on uh, for a minute again. Uh, Frank Clement is a global technical manager membranes with the master builders which is uh, a collaborative agency with the BSF. BSF is the larger group. He's been with them since 1992, bit of his background. He is uh, a chemical technologist by qualification, turned into an engineer as a uh, 
concrete technologist. Okay, very interesting. Uh, he's been um, into the underground space, and like he said, that he's based at Belgium. So he's worked largely, large part of his career, he's worked in Belgium and Netherlands, providing solutions for underground space, both concrete and the waterproofing of concrete. Okay, welcome on board, Frank. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Deleta Thaladi. Deleta. Now she is the design manager and looks after the areas in Europe and ORA. She's tunnel engineer and a design engineer by, by profession. She's a postgraduate. Uh, she is into uh, the underground construction and she's been looking after in Europe, Middle East and Africa. For, again, for the master builder solutions. Uh, unlike uh, Frank, what she's done is she is an engineer turned into a chemical technologist. So it's a, it's a very good combination that we have a chemical technologist turned into an engineer and an engineer turned into a chemical technologist. So two together, they are like a composite. OK, uh, <laughs> like the material, they are like a composite today. So it's a very good team. And we also heard Claire. Uh, Claire, you'll have to introduce yourself because I haven't got your bio. So I'm sorry, but I will not be able to speak much about it. Please say a few lines about yourself, Claire. No worries, thank you. Um, so I am Claire Green. I am based in London, UK. Uh, I work as a senior engineer for Arup in London in the tunnel design team. Uh, and I have been working with uh, master builders for um, five to six years now on this uh, design concept of the composite shell linings, uh, working on the design aspects, um, design modeling and um, proposal of, of design concepts. So I'll be presenting today on the design aspects. OK, thank you, Claire. Thank uh, welcome you. on board. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, one thing again I would like to highlight that, OK, now this is Sunil Sharma from the TEI and his team. They have put together, together a very good program. In this month, we've had four sessions. Today is the fourth session. First two dedicated to the hardcore tunnel engineering. The second was safety and hazards, health issues. And third is regarding materials today. Uh, the fourth is regarding materials. So we are now addressing all issues. We are addressing all segments of our tunneling uh, profession. So uh, more about it a little later. Now I will not spend any more time on the introductions. Over to our speakers, uh, Frank and uh, Deleta, to both of you, uh, whoever is speaking first. Thank you. OK, thank you, thank you for your for your introduction. Um, let, let me explain a little bit why we asked uh, Claire Green to join us. As uh, Claire said, we worked very closely together with uh, with Arup on this composite shell lining and Claire is involved from the beginning and she is well uh, positioned to uh, present the findings uh, that we have done the, over the last few years. Uh, the topics that we will present today will be uh, basically some uh, properties of the spray applied waterproofing membrane, the Marshall 345, as, as said, and also some design properties that will be covered by the letter. Um, then we will have this interface properties and the load sharing investigation that we have done with Arup, which will be presented by Claire. Also, this laminated beam theory will be explained in details, and Claire is well positioned to, to do that. And the last part will be covered by myself, where I talk about um, some references that we have all over the globe. Uh, I will talk about this composition lining handbook that we have developed. And of course, at the end, we have the question and answer. So for the first topic, I hand over to um, uh, Diletta. She will make yeah. the first properties of spray applied waterproof membrane. Yeah. Yeah, as already Frank um, said, uh, um, in my first presentation, I will uh, uh, mainly talk about properties of the spray applied waterproofing membrane. Um, what, what we desire, first of all, when we are underground, of course, a comfortable, safe and attractive space uh, as uh, in the, tun the tunnel in the picture. But unfortunately, very often, the reality is uh, a little bit different because we, we see leakages in tunnel linings, as you can see in the picture, uh, mainly waterproofed by traditional PVC, 
a sheet membrane. So such waterproofing failure means money and time wasted. So the solution for NATM and drill and blast tunnel linings are mainly two. Double shell lining with sheet membranes and composition lining with double bonded membrane. In a double shell lining, we have a primary spray conquer lining as temporary support, a PVC sheet membrane, the bonded from the concrete, and a secondary cast concrete lining as a permanent support. In the composition lining, we have a primary spray conquer lining as permanent support already, not temporary anymore, a double bonded waterproofing membrane and a secondary spray concrete or cast concrete lining as permanent lining. The concept is that uh, in the permanent structure of the composition lining, primary and secondary lining work together as they are connected by the membrane. That is why it is possible to reduce the total lining thickness, saving the temporary lining thickness in respect of a double shell lining, as you can see in this example, in this picture. So today we try to go into details of the composition lining structure and explain how it is possible. Um, we said in double shell lining sheet membranes are used. So here you can see an example of a PVC membrane with a complex scaffolding to install that. And the drainage system, and as an example of the drainage system at the invert. This solution can be useful, for example, with high water ingresses. But there are some challenges related to PVC. Installation has to be done by skilled people. It is important to ensure a perfect welding of seams and it is important to pay attention to not damage the PVC. It is difficult to install in complex geometries and it is difficult to repair leakages if we, for example, we get the water inside the tunnel. That is why compartments and injection systems are mainly used, as you, of course, know already. So if we use a sprayable membrane, we have the creation and application of the membrane in one stage on site, quite easy. And we can apply the membrane also when we have a situation like that, uh, a tunnel with, for example, red bars, um, without any problem because it is a sprayable um, system. And here you can see um, the, the five main topics related to the membrane we will cover in the presentation in the webinar today. Um, as already anticipated, it is a, a polymer-based membrane. It is a sprayed system. It creates an optimum water tightness with a minimum maintenance cost, uh, and it, is, uh, it can be part of a composition lining. So first of all, we said it is a polymer-based membrane. And the polymer inside the membrane is the EVA, ethylene vinyl acetate. This is a, pomol, a, a polymer uh, commonly used, for example, in uh, solar panels for encapsulation of cells. It is an hardware transparent, resistant to corrosion polymer. Moreover, it is plasticizer free. So it means it is stable over time and it means the membrane is stable over time because, you know, in PVC sheet membranes, the plasticizer, in PVC, the plasticizers are leached out over time. And then the consequence is that the sheet membranes become uh, brittle. Uh, this problem, we, we, don't, we don't have this problem with our um, double bonded membrane. And moreover, I'm, I'm uh, sure all you know this polymer because this is the base of bubble gums. The product is in powder. Uh, once it is mixed with water, the curing mechanism starts. And as soon as the water, all the water evaporates from the paste, from um, the, the matrix of polymer chains, we get a cured membrane, a properly cured membrane. This is the same mechanism of latex paintings. 
Moreover, water during spraying doesn't actually affect the membrane proper properties of the, uh, at the end. And uh, a cured membrane is uh, water impermeable and vapor permeable. So it means that cannot be a pressure buildup behind the membrane. This is important from a design point of view, and we will see uh, this topic a little bit mu uh, much more in details in this presentation also. So here you can see um, some main properties of the membrane. Uh, you can see the tensile strength, uh, um, the elongation is 100%, um, the, uh, the membrane is waterproof already at 2 mm thickness, but the most important property is the first one, the double bond and the bond to concrete, uh, on average 1.2 megapascal. And you can see below now um, a video about a tensile bonding test on a core made of a layer of sprayed concrete plus a layer of a regulating mortar plus uh, uh, the double bonded membrane covered by the concrete. This test can prove the double bonding. And while the video runs uh, to the end, please have a look to um, these uh, microscope pictures. You can appreciate here from the zoom that the membrane in black fully encapsulates, um, aggregates and crystals on the concrete surface. So this is the secret of the double bonding. And now you can see in the video the double bonding, the, the bonding happened at a value of 1.8 megapascal. That is higher than 1.2 megapascal we usually, we usually consider as an average. Um, you can see also a few other properties, for example, the crack bridging ability. It depends on the thickness of the membrane with a three millimeter thickness. Uh, for example, the membrane can cover a crack of three millimeter. Uh, the membrane, the system is watertight up to 20 bar. You can see here below the test equipment, there is a vessel with the hole and over that uh, a porous concrete block has been installed and it has been covered, waterproofed with a membrane on top with master seal 345. And then the vessel has been filled with water and then a constant pressure of 20 bar has been applied for 12 months continuously without any leakage as a result. The same test as a reference has been also carried out with the porous concrete block not waterproofed and the test has been stopped after one hour because the water started to flow through the sample and then uh, from the hole. Um, moreover, th with this membrane we don't have the water migration at the interface, thanks as you can see in this picture to the double bonding. And moreover, we can count on a composite mechanical behavior and we can appreciate that from the result of a compression test on core and a flexural test on beam, where you can see the membrane can absorb part of the load, it can bridge the crack and move the crack in a different position to keep the waterproofing of the system, of the tunnel linings. So when we apply a waterproofing sprayable membrane in a tunnel lining, we have that between primary and secondary lining. Uh, at the interface, as you can see here from the zoom, we have a connected system, a composite system that can give us an advantage in terms of behavior, composite behavior between primary and secondary lining, as we will see in details in this webinar, and in terms of optimum water tightness. Um, take into account that the concept of water tightness or waterproofing here is completely different from the PVC sheet membrane concept. So let's have a look to that in details and let's start from uh, the double shell lining with PVC. Here you can see a section of a double shell lining with a temporary spray concrete lining, geotextile, 
the green line is a sheet PVC sheet membrane and a permanent cast in situ concrete lining. If we have a crack in the primer lining with water, you know the water will be free to move behind the PVC. But once water finds a defect inside the PVC sheet membrane, it will pass through and it will be free to move behind the cast in situ concrete lining. And once again the water will find a crack inside, inside the secondary lining, we will get a leakage inside the tunnel. So in this case, uh, we exactly don't know the when we see the leakage inside the tunnel, we exactly don't know the source of the leakage behind. So in this case, it is quite difficult to uh, refurbish the waterproofing of the system, and that is why compartments are often used. Completely different story if we have uh, a composition lining, as you can see here, with a double bonded member, with our, for example, master seal 345, uh, between two layers of concrete. So if we have a crack with water in the primer lining, the water will stop behind the membrane uh, because um, the water will not migrate at the interface um, thanks to the bonding um, to the concrete of the membrane. Um, so if a leakage occurs, very, very unlikely, it means we have a crack in the secondary lining exactly at the same point of the crack in the primary lining through the membrane and it means um, we will have a crack inside the membrane when the crack width overcomes the crack bridging ability of the membrane. But in, in such case it is easy to refurbish the waterproofing of the system just injecting punctually a water, uh, waterproofing resin because thanks to the double bonding membrane we exactly know where is the source of the leakage behind as the water cannot migrate at the interface. We will see uh, this um, system in detail uh, um, in this Thank animation you. video. As you can see, um, we, we will see how the waterproofing spray pole membrane works and how to create a composition lining system. So let, uh, first of all, go down to the rock and excavate our tunnel. Uh, the first step uh, is, of course, to apply uh, a permanent spray concrete lining, uh, possibly fiber reinforced. Then we have uh, uh, to waterproof the tunnel applying our spray ball membrane. But before doing that, we have to check the primary lining and manage minor water leakages. Because remember, um, a sprayed material can be sprayed directly onto water running, but we have to divert this water. Temporary or, as you can see in the video, permanent, permanently, for example, with this solution, installing local drainages. Uh, if the substrate of the concrete is too rough, in order to reduce the membrane consumption, to have a good quality control during installation especially, and to ensure the continuity of the membrane, we suggest to spray a regulating mortar to smoothen the surface. So now we are ready. We, uh, the surface is well prepared to spray the master seal 305 our spray ball waterproofing double bonded membrane. And once the membrane is cured, uh, we can cover that with a permanent spray concrete lining that can be also fiber reinforced, as you can see here. So let's have a look at how this system can ensure an optimum water tightness uh, thanks to the double bonded properties of the membrane. Here you can see the section with all layers we applied. And now consider to have a crack with water from the rock in the primary lining. As you can see here, thanks to the double bonding, the water stops behind the membrane. Um, and as we saw already, if a leakage occurs, it means we have exactly at the same point a crack in the primary lining, in the membrane, in the secondary lining. But thanks to the double bonding, we know exactly the source of the leakage behind and restoring the waterproofing of the system is really easy, as you can see here. 
through injecting few liters of resin. And here you can read, you can have a look uh, uh, to a summary of advantages in using a pre-applied waterproof membrane. Um, with this membrane, uh, when we consider the water load, we can have different options because this membrane is suitable to create uh, different systems like the undrained system, where there is a full round waterproofing application and where we have to consider a full uh, water pressure on the lining during the design. We can create a partially drained system with systematic and local drainages and we can consider a partial pressure relief on the lining and we have a mixed system with a part undrained covered by a master steel triple five by double bonded membrane and uh, at the crown a, a drained part um, with the installation of a PVC sheet membrane. Let's have a look in detail to these uh, three main systems. In the undrained tunnel, the sprayed membrane um, reduces the risk of uh, water inflows or water losses, and the membrane is applied full round. Um, this system is especially used for um, urban areas, as you can see here, hydropower plants, or below uh, sites of interest. The partially drained tunnel is often used to avoid the buildup of the groundwater pressure on the lining. In this case, we have to use a drainage pipes or strip drains, as you can see here, for example, in this example from Switzerland, the Mormon tunnel, where the strip drains have been installed systematically along the tunnel and longitudinally connected to a drainage system at the base. The mixed system is typically used to protect users and services from dripping water, and it, it uh, consists of uh, uh, an undrained part represented by double bonded membrane at the crown, a, a drained part represented by sheet membranes at the invert. Uh, here you can see an example of the mixed system from Crossrail in London with Master Seal 345 applied. Uh, here at the crown and bench, uh, connected to the PVC sheet membrane at the invert. So in this case, it is important to follow the rules of the corrected overlapping between master seal 345 and PVC sheet membrane. As you can see in this detail, you will get all details about that, um, about this webinar today. Let's have a look now to different design options we, we, we have. Because when we talk about waterproofing double bonded membrane, we can consider the membrane as only a waterproofing layer, or we can consider that in a composite lining configuration uh, to get, of course, some more benefits. So let's go step by step and imagine um, to, to start from uh, uh, a traditional double shell lining with PVC sheet membrane and imagine only to replace the sheet membrane with master seal 345 with the spray double bonded membrane. In this case, we can get already some benefits. Uh, the system water tightness thanks to the double bonding of the membrane, a rapid membrane application as it is a, a spray material and higher flexibility of construction and an easier maintenance uh, as, as we already underlined as we, we saw in the animation. Going ahead, if we replace uh, also the cast in situ concrete lining with a permanent spray concrete lining, we can get another advantage, the faster installation of the inner lining, of the secondary lining. And we can fully optimize the lining if we consider also to replace the temporary spray concrete lining from the double shell lining with a permanent spray concrete lining. So in this case, we can consider the composite action and reduce the total lining thickness. As in this case, the primary lining is not temporary anymore. It is permanent 
uh, it is connected to the secondary lining to the membrane and it contributes to bear long term loss. Here we have an overview on different design options. So from double shell lining to composite shell lining, of course, the most innovative concept is the composite shell lining uh, with the reduced total lining thickness from a structural point of view. Now, at the beginning, as anticipated uh, um, at, in the first slides of this presentation, now we will have a look uh, to difference in water load in tunnel lining. Differences between double shell lining and composite shell lining, we already know. In the double shell lining, again, we have a temporary spray concrete lining, geotextile, PVC sheet membrane and permanent cast concrete lining. In the composition lining, we have two layers of sprayed concrete um, bonded together through a waterproofing double bonded membrane. If we see at the literature, we find such figures showing a typical loading distribution. In double shell lining, both linings act independently from each other. So it means that 100% of the water load is behind the sheet membrane and it acts only on the secondary lining as the PVC is the bonded from the concrete. Uh, in the composition lining, thanks to the double bonding properties of the membrane, both spray concrete lining plus the membrane act in a composite behavior. So both the ground load and the water load act on the full structure and not only behind the membrane. So we ask, what is actually the water pressure behind the sprayed membrane? And to answer to this question, we investigated more this topic, and especially a colleague of us spent uh, some years uh, uh, to carry out many in situ and lab tests regarding the moisture distribution in the composition lining. In several Scandinavian tunnels designed, as you can see in the drawings, uh, in detail, on the left, you can see a conceptual model of a typical design of a Scandinavian tunnel in a hard rock below the main groundwater table uh, where the rock mass is fracturated and saturated. The composition lining structure is applied with uh, the double bonded membrane with master seal 345 and the first sprayed concrete lining is in direct contact with the water. Um, on the right side, you can see the same model, but activated. I mean, you can see the water flow through these blue arrows. And in the light blue arrow, you can see the moisture transport through the lining. We actually studied uh, uh, in this, studied in deep in this research. Um, again, since the composition lining differs from the traditional double shell lining with sheet membrane, it is expected that there is a difference also in the moisture distribution in the tunnel lining. So in details, uh, cores have been extracted from the lining and moisture distribution was uh, calculated, was um, tested, was determined in 40 millimeter sections, as you can see here, every 40 millimeters. Um, we got the moisture distribution. And uh, for every 40 millimeter section, the degree of uh, capillary saturation in situ uh, has been calculated. Uh, consider that the degree of capillary saturation, the DCS, is the ratio between the actual capillary pore water content to the maximum capillary pore water content. And one of the results of this test was that uh, despite the membrane itself absorbs 40%, it's directly immersed in water, and it is the maximum water absorption, it can reach an equilibrium in the composition lining structure, as you can see from this dashed line. Uh, it reaches an equilibrium in terms of water content during the service life and the equilibrium is around 15%. Mm, 
Moreover, in a sandwich structure, the conditions of the membrane are constant. So um, we have only the 15% of DCS in, in uh, the membrane. So can we expect any water pressure on the membrane? Considering that we have uh, a saturated rock here on the left and the tunnel environment here on the right, we have water feed uh, through the primary concrete lining. Then we have a vapor permeable membrane. Then we have the secondary lining. So we can state that to have a water pressure behind the lining on the behind the membrane on the membrane the concrete until the membrane has to be fully saturated but in this chart likely we can see that we can never have a full saturation behind the membrane because in both these two examples from two different tunnels we can see a decreasing of the dcs of the degree of capillary saturation inside the primary lining, through the primary lining, reaching at the interface with the membrane, that is the green line, 80-85%. Uh, even if we are in uh, different tunnels with different concrete thickness, as you can see, appreciate. The thickness is different, but we have more or less the same DCS at the interface. So it means an exposure to static water pressure at the membrane interface is very, very unlikely. And here we have the practical consequence. As the spray applied membrane is a vapor permeable system, it is not a barrier again, um, against the water as uh, the PVC sheet membrane is. Uh, but it allows uh, the moisture transport from the rock to the tunnel environment. This means that with the composition lining, the secondary lining is not actually designed to withstand uh, to the full water pressure, but we really can consider a composite action thanks to the double bonding vapor permeable membrane. Um, to demonstrate the suitability of such lining system based on the sprayed concrete and sprayed membrane and to demonstrate the long-term durability under uh, the given exposure conditions, we, um, we, we had also to demonstrate that one of the most important properties of the membrane doesn't change over years. So the tensile bonding strength we demonstrated it didn't change over years. Um, I proceeded to measure the tensile bond strength uh, uh, in situ without extracting cores was used without extracting cores from lining. And uh, as you can see here in this picture, and the main purpose uh, of this procedure was to test the tensile bond strength under as realistic conditions as possible. So you can see in the drawing the conceptual uh, layout. Uh, the test specimen here was represented uh, by an overcored part of the lining structure. Um, here you can see uh, pictures uh, uh, during the preparation of the, of the test in, in the lining structure. And here you can see the cores, the core uh, after the pull of test. So, uh, results of these investigations on tensile bonding strength are in the chart here. We can see, generally speaking, from here, that bond strength on cores in laboratory. Um, which are conditioned by immersion and frozen toad for 35 cycles, uh, tend to give slightly lower values compared to site testing. But as you can see, mm, it is not a significant uh, reduction. So the tensile bonding strength in situ um, was around uh, 
was in a range of 1.1 and 1.5 megapascal. If you remember, I talk about an average value as a property of the membrane of 1.2 megapascal. So we are in the range and uh, uh, these results, we got these, these results after five years from the application. So it means uh, the, the uh, tensile bonding strain didn't decrease over a year. So based on findings of this research, we can say the lining system is long-term durable. And that means that in, in suitable ground conditions, it is also possible to make uh, uh, a very competitive design from a total cost per perspective. And just as a summary, if we want to go from a double shell lining with sheet membrane to a composition lining with a double bonded membrane with master seal 305, we have to take into account that the composition lining is a simple structure, as you could see, but with a complex concept behind. The composition lining is the interaction uh, of three layers, concrete, double bonded waterproofing membrane and concrete. So it is necessary to understand the composite behavior on long term in terms of interface properties and load sharing capabilities. And moreover, this is much more important if we want to get also a thickness reduction uh, of the tunnel lining. And about this point, you will be um, you will see uh, results from uh, the uh, joint research with Arup in Claire presentation after me, so you will get all details about the design point of view. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Diletta. I will share my screen now. Can you see my screen, Diletta? Not yet. No, nope, not yet. Let me try again. Apologies. No problem. Yep, yeah, 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 yeah. OK, thank you. Right, good afternoon. Um, as discussed at the beginning, I'm Claire Green from uh, Arup in London, and I'm going to take you through as Diletta uh, introduced the, the design concepts behind composite shell lining design. So start, I won't go through this in detail because Deles has explained it um, a number of times in her presentation uh, very clearly. So just to recap here, we have the primary lining. Ooh. Is my screen? The screen is gone. Someone. That should be it. Yeah, it's back. OK, uh, we have the in the double shell lining concept. We have the primary lining, which is assumed to degrade in the long term in terms of design. And we have the secondary lining, which is the permanent lining with the waterproofing membrane, which is a typically the sheet membrane in between. In the composite shell lining, we have a primary lining which is permanent and a secondary lining which is permanent with the sprayed waterproofing system in between. So in order to understand the, the way that this works, we need to understand the bond strength at that interface in terms of shear, compression and tension between the two lining systems. And that's what I'm going to run through with you today. To date. So I'll take you through uh, from the beginning where we carried out some lab tests with uh, master builders um, using waterproof membrane sandwiched cores and beams. These tests were carried out to obtain the interface parameters um, for our modeling and, and understanding um, what's, what's happening at the interface. We then used LS Dyna, which is a finite element software, um, to calibrate to the lab tests. So we calibrated to the core and beam tests from the, the labs 
and then we use that to uh, model a tunnel section analysis. So I'll show you um, the steps we went through there. And then I'll talk about our results interpretation and how we have shown that the composite action and load sharing is, is shown to be happening in a tunnel section. And then over here is a, is a design approach, which has been mentioned a couple of times, the laminate beam theory. And we'll take you through that and the way that we've developed a new design approach to understand the potential to save uh, secondary lining thickness in design. So first, we'll go through the lab tests. So we sprayed um, test panels at the Tunnel and Underground Construction Academy in London. Uh, and you can see there we have at the bottom here, we have L18, you can see has had um, sprayed um, sprayed concrete, sprayed fiber reinforced concrete applied. And in L20 there, you can see the, the Master Seal 345 applied. So we had sandwiched um, test panels with layers of concrete, Master Seal and concrete again. The test panels were cut to obtain beam samples and also core samples, which you can see here. The cores were taken at various angles to the vertical to allow us to look at uh, shear, ca shear capacity of the concrete cores. This is the sample preparation and testing. Can I just ask? Sorry, somebody is not on the uh, He's on the speaker, here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the sample preparation and testing. So in the Tunneling and Underground Construction Academy, we stored several of the cores that prior to testing. And you can see here, the primary lining of the, the test cores was exposed to water. So that's sitting in a water bath, um, but that was not high enough to touch the layer of master seal in the middle of the core. So, and then these cores were kept in a climate chamber with 20 degrees C and 65% humidity. So the idea of this was to try to replicate the saturation conditions that would be seen in a real tunnel. Um, so the water is coming from the ground through the primary lining um, at the, the rate that it travels through the concrete. We tested 139 cores uh, in a compression test machine. Um, and because we had various angles to the vertical of the master seal layer within the cores, we were able to test um, the shear um, the shear properties of the within the compression tests. You can see here this is one of the cores that's undergone the compression testing and is as sheared along this face. The beam tests were tested. We did 38 beams in notched beam tests in Switzerland. Um, and they were, as Deletta showed earlier, um, they showed some crack bridging properties uh, in the way that they failed. So now to look at the interpretation of the testing. Um, the cores and beams that I've described earlier were done in various configurations to understand the impacts of uh, the construction method on, on the, the core or, or on the lining composition. So we did um, some sort of base tests um, where there was only primary and secondary lining. So only sprayed, only sprayed fiber reinforced concrete. So no master seal. Um, we did two different sets with sprayed primary and secondary with master seal in the center. The C2 line here, you can see the R, that refers to the regulating layer. So that was from Diletta's video, um, the layer of sprayed uh, mortar that does not have st steel fiber reinforcement. So we did one with and one without in order to understand the impacts of that regulating layer on design properties. And then we did a primary master seal and secondary layering with cast concrete to understand the impacts of that as a construction method choice. So these are the configurations that we did for cores and beams. On the right, you can see our approach to the failure to the, um, the, the, the interface because the interface has a very complex um, interaction. We have this primary and secondary lining 
which have engineering properties. Uh, the sprayed waterproofing membrane itself has its material engineering properties. We have a varying thickness of membrane on a small scale across the, the section. You would have undulations in the sprayed waterproofing membrane. And then you come into you know, minor effects such as surface roughness and where the bond strength varies. So instead of trying to understand each of these properties in detail on an individual basis, our approach at Arup was to look at a single interface zone. So to take the whole area that is the primary, sprayed and secondary, so at the interface, and represent that with common engineering parameters, such as the more Coulomb parameters, uh, cohesion, angle of friction, and then Young's and shear modulus. So to represent that zone as a, as a plane that has those more Coulomb parameters was our proposal for understanding the interface. And we took that forward in our analysis. So here we can see this is the typical stress and strain curve that came from one core test. This whole slide is about the core tests. And you can see here that we've interpreted the stress and strain curve to find a point where we see a change in gradient, a change in behavior of the core test. And we took that as our failure point or our peak point where it was behaving in a certain way. That point we plotted for each of the core tests. So you can see here we have the shear stress and normal stress uh, plotted and the points all represent core tests, uh, these points from the core tests. And we've grouped them different ways. Um, you can see here on the left, we have the joint roughness coefficient. So we've grouped them by uh, a degree of, of how rough the bond seemed to be uh, using a joint roughness coefficient uh, from rock mechanics. And then also on the right here, we've looked at sprayed cores versus cast cores um, to see the trends. But essentially what we found was that the angle of friction and the cohesion values, the more Coulomb values that came out of this data, didn't really vary greatly depending on how rough the joint was or um, whether or not it was sprayed or cast, whether or not there was a regulating layer involved. So we did find that the construction decisions that are, are being made for the lining installation aren't having a direct impactful impact to the design properties. Going forward for our um, finite element modeling, we adopted the sprayed core values um, because in, uh, in typical installation, it is sprayed um, concrete that's used. The other uh, pro property that we wanted to determine from the testing is the shear modulus. So this is the, uh, the plot of the shear modulus values from the core tests, uh, and we saw a distribution uh, of this type. In order to get a representative value for uh, for modeling, we we sort of took a reasonable, reliable data limit of 15 and averaged the values that were below 15, ignoring the sort of high erroneous values for a representative value for modeling. So we ended up with the more Coulomb strength parameters, a cohesion of 1.56, uh, a phi uh, friction angle of 12.1 degrees and a shear modulus of 7 MPa. So, repeating the lab tests using the finite element. So LS Dyna, as I said, is this finite element uh, modeling software that was used. And we calibrated the core tests first. So you can see here, we've recreated the lab test in the modeling with the uh, interface being modeled as a solid element uh, with the co more Coulomb parameters from our test uh, results. The more Coulomb model is a, is a strain softening modified model. So the post peak softening behavior is accounted for by allowing the friction and cohesion to change with plastic strain, which gives us our post peak behavior here you can see. So we did each of the 45 degree, 55 degree and 70 degree angled cores as a calibration exercise. And you can see the gray and black um, lines are from the lab tests and the red is our LS Dyna calibrated um, model. 
and you can see that we were able to capture the behavior quite well using those more Coulomb parameters. Similarly, we calibrated the beam tests. So we re re reproduced the uh, beam tests in LS Dyna and were able to calibrate two different things. The first is on the left. We took the beams where there was no master seal in the center of, of the, the layers. We just had primary and secondary sprayed fiber reinforced concrete. And the reason that we've calibrated this in our modeling is to ensure that the modeling um, using the Winfrith model is capturing the SFRC behavior well because um, it's a sort of a complex material in itself. So we were able to show that the Winfrith was able to capture the sprayed fiber reinforced concrete behavior. And then on the right, we have the sandwiched core. So it has master seal 345 between the primary and secondary lining. And again, using our more Coulomb parameters, we were able to show uh, a good match with our test results. So our model was set up for the beam and the cores um, to be showing the same behavior as the tests. We were then able to apply that to the tunnel section uh, and model um, those, those more Coulomb parameters in a tunnel, uh, tunnel section. So I should say all the modeling that we've done is in a stiff clay uh, geological condition. Uh, London clay is the parameters that we've used for our geological information. Um, and our tunnel section analysis has actually been based on a, on a real 10 meter diameter railway platform section from London. We have assumed full face excavation, so uh, we haven't done a top heading uh, bench and invert staged tunnel excavation within our modeling uh, in order to kind of keep straightforward interpretation of the composite results and try to understand those on their own. So we've done full face excavation of a 10 meter tunnel. Groundwater pressure is modeled to act at the extra dos of the primary lining. And we have three different bond conditions. So full slip, composite and full bond. So these three were modeled to be able to compare the composite to other conditions. So full slip, the modeling situation for that is where you have the sprayed waterproofing membrane that has a full slip uh, input in the modeling. So the secondary lining is not connected to the primary in any way. It sort of sits within it uh, free to move. The full bond on the other hand is where the member of the interface in the between the two linings is modeled as fully fixed. So the primary and secondary lining are moving fully bonded. And then we have the third condition in the middle where we have our composite modeling. So the membrane is, is modeled using the more Coulomb parameters we found earlier to represent that load sharing that we found from the lab tests. At the bottom here, you can see the stages of the tunnel analysis. The first stage is to model some ground load relaxation uh, when there's no lining. So this is the case before the TBM reaches um, the, the, the point of excavation, you have some ground load relaxing onto um, the area. So this is modeled as 40% 40, 40 relaxation, um, which is anecdotal um, good practice for London clay, essentially. Um, it's an assumption. And then we have the following stages. We have installing the primary lining. We then have a further ground relaxation onto just the primary lining. This stage represents the stage, the construction phase, where the primary lining is installed, but the secondary has not yet been installed. And that time period can be up to a couple of years, and therefore we have some ground relaxation onto the primary lining by itself. And then we have the installation of the secondary lining and further ground relaxation to, to the final condition. This stage here, this lambda two, is a representation of how much ground how much load is applied to the primary lining by itself. Um, and it's really a function of how much time passes. Um, so we have varied that lambda two value from zero up to 40%. And you'll see in our results as we go through, just we've had a look at the impacts of how much load goes onto the primary before the secondary is installed. So that's the way we set up the model. And these are the results. So this, the full slip is shown on the left. We're talking about hoop stress here in the lining uh, condition. 
The full slip is shown on the left, the fully connected on the right and the composite in the middle. As you can see in the full slip, there is no hoop stress. This pink color represents basically zero. There's no hoop stress in the full slip model secondary lining because these two linings are not connected and there's no way for the, the loading to, to move on to the secondary lining. In the fully connected, the section is carrying the hoop stress across the full section because it's acting as one piece of concrete. And in the composite, we see a variation in hoop across both linings with a step in the center. If we zoom in on the invert here for each of them, because it's the clearest point where the, the conditions can be seen, you can see here the full slip, all hoop is within the primary lining here. The fully connected, we have a, a variation in hoop across the full section. And in the composite, we see this stepped behavior at the sprayed waterproofing layer. So this hoop stress, these hoop stress results are showing that the composite lining is able to share load between the primary and secondary lining. But we wanted to understand that in a little bit more detail. So we did a, another model uh, of the similar setup, but we added additional radial deformation. And we did this by applying a, uh, a surcharge at surface in the model. So increasing the load on the tunnel. So you can see here on the right, this is the deformed shape, exaggerated uh, deformed shape, sketched up for um, the London clay, stiff clay condition, where you have increased vertical forces compared to horizontal in the ground. And so you get this uh, deformed shape of the tunnel lining. And we wanted to see if we were seeing what we were seeing in terms of tunnel deformation and the impact of primary and secondary lining in composite lining. So you can see here, this is the crown condition. And these again are hoop stress, hoop thrust um, plots. So you can see here, this is the ground and this is the tunnel, so inside the tunnel. So this is the distance through the lining in meters. And we have here the primary lining, a step in hoop and the secondary lining. The primary and secondary lining are sharing the load because you can see they're both carrying hoop stress across the section. They're both carrying the hoop stress in a, in a sagging condition. So the sense of the load uh, carrying capacity is the same direction in the two linings. And we see a step at the location of the, the membrane. As I said here before, with the lambda 2 value, case 1, 2, and 3 are varying uh, values of lambda 2. So just to be clear, lambda 2 of, of 0%, so case 1, the blue line is showing that there's no load relaxed onto the lining when the primary lining is installed by itself. So the primary lining is not loaded additionally before the secondary lining is installed. And 40% uh, indicates that 40% of the ground load is put onto the primary lining alone before the secondary lining is put in place in the model. So it shows the variation here. Um, in, in sort of time delay and how much they share the lining. And we'll come on to that in the bending moment discussion in a second. So we also looked at the axis. Again, the axis or the axis is shown to be in, in a hogging condition. The primary and secondary lining are both carrying hoop in the same sense. And we see a step at the ax at the interface. Similarly with the knee, we see the same condition. And then here at the invert location, we have it in hogging as well, and we see the same thing. So what you get is this expected, the deformed shape is showing to be as expected under the loading conditions. And what we were interested in is this step because these, these graphs are, are all at different scale. So we took the step uh, value at each of the locations around the tunnel, and we had a look. So here we have the crown axis, knee and invert locations, and this is an indication of the step in hoop thrust at the, the interface layer. And you can see that that step varies around the tunnel section. It varies depending on the location of, of where you are in the tunnel section, even though the input strength parameter for shear was constant at 7 MPA. So those interface parameters at 7 MPA shear modulus is constant around the tunnel, but the result was a variation in the way that the shear, the shear 
works and the way that the hoop is carried around the tunnel. To look a little bit about bending moment, um, these are this is a plot of the bending moment around the tunnel section. You can see here full slip, composite and full bond. In the full slip condition, all of the bending is taken within the primary lining PL because there's no connection to the secondary, so there's no load in the secondary and no bending. So the primary lining is taking all the bending. The full bond, you can see here, the primary lining is taking much less than in the full slip condition. So it's taking uh, much less. And the secondary lining is taking some of the bending moment. So they are sharing the load. The increase and decrease that you can see here is related, as I said, to this lambda 2 value. So basically what this is showing is in the gray condition, there's no time delay, there's no load applied to the primary lining before the secondary is installed. So there's more ability for the primary and secondary to share the load. As you increase the lambda 2 value, you're increasing the time delay and you're increasing the amount of load that the primary lining takes on its own. So you're decreasing the degree to which they share, but they're still shown to be sharing the bending moment between the primary and secondary in this red case. But the primary is taking more in this case. In the composite, what this graph really shows is that it has the same um, sense as the full bond. The primary and secondary are sharing the bending moment between them. And the increase and decrease with time delay is showing the same trend as the full bond. What's interesting is that the, the composite overall has a higher bending moment than the full bond. And we believe that might be linked to the fact that the composite has the, the double bond um, and has a compressible layer between the two concrete layers and therefore may be um, impacting the bending moment that the tunnel is taking. That's something we want to look at in more detail. But what this shows is that we see a same similar load sharing trend in the composite lining for bending moment. And then the last test that we looked at on the tunnel section analysis that we carried oh, out was to look at the, the tensile and shear displacement. So if you see here on the right, we have the primary lining and secondary lining with a sprayed waterproofing layer between. The A points represent the starting point of a location of a node um, either side of the waterproofing layer. And the B points indicate where those end up once you have deformed the tunnel. So the points may move in shear, they may move in relative to each other in a tensile way or in a, com a compressive way. So it's interesting to understand the way that these points, that the, the, the waterproofing layer, the two layers move in relation to each other. So what we did was we looked at where the, where the points start and where they end up to understand the tensile and shear displacement values. And on these graphs, you can see this on the left is a typical pullout test curve of a double bonded interface layer. So it's very much like the, um, the video that Diletta showed. And this is the typical result of, of what the, um, the master seal was able to, to take. And the 0 0.02, which is small there with the arrow, is the value that we got out of our modeling. So that's the value that the, that the model showed that the tensile displacement that's being put on the master seal, which is well within the, um, the curve of, of capacity, essentially. And similarly, on the shear stress deformation curve um, from a similar research project on master seal 345, we can see the shear displacement value that we, we found in our modeling is much, much smaller than the, the curve that, that uh, master seal 345 is capable of, of taking. It should be said that these tests um, were done with a, a deformation of 10 millimeters on the diameter. So that's only a 0.1% ovalization of the tunnel. One thing that we want to do going forward is looking at a, at a higher degree of ovalization to see whether when the tunnel is deformed even to sort of ultimate limit state conditions, um, that the tunnel is that these sort of tensile and shear displacements don't go up in a in a in an extreme way. So we want to test that. Um, but at the moment, these are these are encouraging results for the tensile and shear displacement. So now I've talked through our 
lab testing and our on our modeling activities i'll go through quickly the design approach that we want to talk about with laminate beam theory so this is we wanted to be able to talk to develop a design method because the ls dyna models that we have talked about to date are quite complex um, and actually understanding the degree to which you can reduce your lining thickness um, is something that we want to be able to do in a sort of um, qualitative way. So we took in information from the laminate glass theory. So if you think it seems kind of strange to have inspiration from glass for tunnels, but it is a very similar concept um, in terms of you have two stiff materials uh, and then you have a layer of glue in between. And there's been a lot of research in the laminate glass um, industry for facades and things to see, you know, the degree of bending um, within these glass beams uh, when they're a laminate beam. So we took the concept. You can see here basically what the laminate theory does is it creates an equivalence mathematically between a laminate or in our case a composite and a monolithic piece of glass in their case. So it uses um, the, the, the equations to um, give an equivalent deflection of a single piece of glass versus a laminate piece of glass. So in our case, we know the primary lining requirements because we know the thickness we need to support short-term loading in the ground. We know the thickness of our sprayed waterproofing layer. We know our secondary, we know our secondary lining's Young's modulus. Young's modulus of primary, shear modulus of the sprayed waterproofing layer. And we know if we took uh, the long-term condition, if we just had monolithic concrete, plain concrete, what thickness we would need to support the long-term loads. We can work that out. The only thing we don't know in this condition is this secondary lining, how thick that needs to be to give equivalent deflection. And that's what we use the laminate theory for. So it's basically working on you know, the, the material properties, Young's and, and shear modulus of the of the materials, the thickness of the layers, and it gives you an equivalent thickness of um, a monolithic beam. And it's all to do with beam theory. So if we apply those equations to a tunnel condition, um, this, as I was talking about earlier, is the sort of typical loading condition on the lining um, in the London clay condition with increased vertical forces. And this is your idealized deformed shape. If you take that as a concept, you have vertical, you have virtual hinges in the tunnel lining where you have zero bending moment. And in between those, you could liken that to a beam. So in order to apply this beam theory, we have looked at a quarter of the, of the perimeter length of the, of the circular tunnel. So the L in the laminate beam theory equations we took as a quarter of the circumference. And then the, the constant beta value is 9.6 in the Benison equations for a uniformly distributed load, which in, in tunneling we, we have. So if we take those assumptions, we wanted to understand whether or not we really could apply this laminate theory to, um, to, to composite lining, because we wanted to validate basically that it worked. So we took the finite element analysis models that we had, so the LS Dyna models that were calibrated to our lab tests using the more Coulomb parameters. And we did two models. We did a model here with the primary lining, secondary lining, and the sprayed waterproofing layer in between. And we did a model with monolithic, just thick concrete. We varied this thickness of value and we varied the secondary lining thickness and we did these two models to obtain a thickness relationship between a composite and monolithic lining which provides an equivalent deflection so essentially we were doing what the Benison equations claim to do but we were doing it with our calibrated finite element model and then we compared that to the Benison equation results that were done by hand using the, the mathematics and you can see here, the red dots indicate the LS Dyna and the laminate theory, you know, hand calculations are indicated by the black line. 
And on this graph we have, uh, on the, this axis here, we have the secondary and primary lining thickness relationship. And we have the equivalent monolithic lining and primary lining relationship. So it shows quite well, we were surprised at how, how well the LS Dyna model was able to model the same thing that came out of, of the laminate theory um, in an Excel spreadsheet. So um, we thought we could use this as an indication of how much you can reduce the secondary lining potential. And it's, it's a quick way to now analyze the secondary lining thickness reduction potential. And it's showing similar results to what you would, do, what you would find if you were running it in this detailed LS Dyna model. So we wanted to verify that before we proposed um, it as a design concept. And we looked at various variations. So the black line in the middle, you can see, is a diameter of tunnel of six meters, uh, a thickness of the master seal of three millimeters, a shear modulus of seven MPA, and a primary lining thickness of 250 millimeters. So then we varied some of the values. We varied the shear modulus to test what it meant if it was bigger. We tested a thicker master seal layer because you know, on site uh, keeping three mil is, you know, can be challenging. So a variation within a few mil on that. And then we also tried a, a, a larger tunnel diameter here. So we had a 10 meter diameter tunnel with an equivalent um, primary lining increase. And as you can see on each of these, the dashed line with the circles is the numerical model result. And the line, the solid line is what the laminate theory said we should be seeing. And as you can see, the, the impact to the ratios does go up and down with variation. The, the verification of the laminate theory as a good tool by using LS Dyna. In each case, you see quite good agreement between the laminate theory and the numerical modeling. So we felt comfortable that the, the laminate theory is applicable for equivalent deflection uh, for composite tunnel lining. So to give an example, because it's always easier to, to understand these concepts with um, a real world example. This is a, a design chart that's been produced, a sim similar graph. So we have the monolithic thickness and primary thickness on the bottom and the secondary and primary thicknesses on the left. And here we've done various things. So this design chart, what's good about it is it can be produced for any sort of tunnel combination um, that needs to be reviewed. So here we've done various primary lining thicknesses and we've done various shear modulus input values. For all of these, the tunnel diameter is six meters, the interface thickness is five millimeters, and the concrete Young's modulus is 35 GPA. So, example of use of the design chart. If we take this, these inputs that I just went through, your temporary ULS condition, so, in the short term and construction stage, you need a primary lining thickness of 225. That's been calculated based on the loads that you have in your primary line, in your temporary condition in construction. Your primary lining thickness is required at 225. Your permanent ULS, you do a calculation here of the thickness of, of monolithic concrete that you would need to support long term loads. And that is calculated as 325. Your H equivalent is 325. So your, your relation of equivalent to primary is 325 over 225, which is 1.44. If you use that on the graph uh, here, you can go up and whichever input condition line you're interested in, you can then go across and you have 0 0.71 on the left axis, which means your primary to secondary ratio or secondary to primary ratio is 0.71, giving a secondary lining thickness of 160, essentially. So you've got about 71% of your primary lining thickness required for secondary. So in your composite lining condition, you have the 160 plus your primary lining, which is a permanent lining in this case, 385. In your traditional double shell situation as a comparison, you would need the primary lining at 225 for the short term loads, and you would need the monolithic thickness 
because your secondary lining is acting by itself in the long-term condition to carry all loads. So you would need the sum of the two, which is 550. So here we're seeing a 30% reduction indicated using the design chart. And this is the sort of numbers that we see, it's 20 to 30% across various um, tests uh, of use of the design chart. And it allows you to quickly understand the degree to which you could reduce your secondary lining thickness based on equivalent deflection and the, the laminate theory. So to go through some conclusions and limitations of the research to date. Um, the bond interface failure zone strength parameter is not significantly influenced by the lining construction method or the layer configuration. So that's what I was talking about there with whether or not you have a regulating layer, whether or not you cast or spray the concrete, they didn't seem to impact the strength parameter for design. The use of the more Coulomb strain softening model for the bond interface failure zone gave a reasonable match between real test and calibration. So we found that that model is, um, is, is a good tool for modeling the, the interface failure zone. The sprayed waterproofing layer can either be in compression or in tension when the tunnel undergoes deformation. And there is a certain level of shear displacement. But those shear and tensile uh, stresses that or, or shear and tensile displacements that we saw were, were well below um, the, the peak from, from laboratory tests. But as I said, that's for that low level of ovalization. And so we need to fully explore greater ovalization of the tunnel. For laminate theory, simple assumptions such as beam span and the parameter of beta, the laminate glass theory is found to be applicable to tunnel lining design. And using that design chart, we can see approximately 20 to 30% reduction of total thickness of the lining uh, for a typical circular tunnel condition as a, an initial starting point for, for the reduction potential. And then just a couple of limitations. So we have done uh, all of our modeling to date based on calibration to small scale tests. So a full scale test in a tunnel is required to, to validate um, the sort of calibrations that we've done to date. Potential damage of the bond interface um, from fire is, a, is a, a, an item that we want to explore further because if the primary or the secondary lining is damaged within a fire, it's interesting to understand from a structural perspective what that bond interface, how that bond interface changes. The long-term behavior of the interface, so not of the material, but um, Diletta spoke about um, the durability of the material, um, but what we're talking about here is the, the interface and the bond characteristics between the three layers and how they behave in the long term. And then applicability to various ground conditions. We will, there's further analysis and test results required to understand, as I said, greater tunnel deformation and also to understand um, saturation level variation uh, of the interface. And then the last one is about laminate theory. Um, what we've presented is um, about equivalent deflection. Um, but there is also a capacity, there is also in the Benison equations, the ability to look at equivalent stress within the linings or within the layers. Um, but in a primary lining in a tunnel, you have an initial stress condition. You have um, a stress condition that's, that's in place before the secondary lining is installed, which is not completely comparable to um, the laminate glass theory. So we would want to do a bit more research to understand whether or not what we've shown is conservative. But so far, the design charts are showing um, the, the laminate theory to be a good tool as a starting point for composite lining design. Thank you for your attention and uh, I will pass to Frank to present the next section. Okay, thank you, Claire. Thank you. If you no, OK, then. if I stop sharing, sharing, there we go. I saw there all, are already some uh, questions raised, but we will do the questions after this uh, last presentation. Um, so let me see if this is the correct one.
Can you see my screen? Somebody can confirm? Yes, uh, yes Frank. You can okay, see. perfect. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Thanks for that. So um, you heard already a lot of, of design and, and, and figures and uh, examples. Um, let me go a little bit on, on reference that we have had and also uh, tell you about the design book that has been uh, established. Um, application, to give you a flavor about application, uh, the letter told you that the product is, is coming as a powder. That means it is mixed with water at the nozzle. So the application steps are pre-wetting and cleaning the surface. And also the surface has to be smoothed out with a regulating layer. If it's too rough, you see in this video a uh, nicely prepared uh, surface. Um, then the membrane is coming as a dry powder in bags of 15 kg. Um, and then you use a simple dry spray machine. That can be a Mako Piccola, as you can see in this uh, part of the video, which is uh, the blue one. But you can use also uh, a different kind of equipment like the, the reed pumps. These are also suitable for spraying the Mars 345. So you just fill it in the hopper, you convey it by air to the nozzle, and you spray a three to four millimeter layer in one go onto the surface. Essential is to have the right nozzle uh, configuration, to have a good pre-wetting of the, um, of the material, and you just spray it as a thick toothpaste onto the wall. And so here you can see a surface that's nicely prepared with a smoothing layer. You measure the thickness and you say if you have three millimeter, three and a half millimeter on thickness, you are okay. Quality supervisor is checking the, the thickness. He is marking the areas that has been undersprayed and you do a, just a patch up and respraying of this area. So it's a very quick and easy spray application. Application rates <clears throat> in 50 to 100 square meters per hour. This is not a new product. This, the first version of this sprayable membrane was already in, introduced in 1999. And one of the first projects that we ever did with this kind of technology was an hydro power project in Brazil that was in the year 2000. So that is our oldest reference. So basically already 20 years old, but that was the first application of a double bonded waterproof membrane. And you can see also in this picture that you have starter bars for the inner lining. This was the shaft, and here you can see the application of the spray bar membrane. To highlight a few of the um, applications, this was an escape tunnel. That was an existing tunnel that needed an escape, additional escape tunnel for safety reasons. And this was, of course, in the, in the mountains in Switzerland. This was uh, applied in 2005. You can see here some, some pictures of the application. The letter told you this is uh, flexible in design. So in this case, it was a fully tanked design solution. So sprayed the crown and also the invert. Sprayed in 2005, you can see some, some pictures. They used the Mako Piccola in this application. You can see the fully tanked design solution. And essential also to have a good lightning to show that the sprayer can see what he's uh, spraying. Um, as I said, this is already in operation since 2005. And in this tunnel, we had the possibility to monitor the pressure, the permanent static water pressure on the lining. Uh, so they installed this gauge. And we've seen that the pressure on the lining is around four and a half to five bar. As I said, this is a fully tanked solution. The tunnel is still perfectly, perfectly dry with no signs of leakages with five bar water pressure over 15 years. One other project that I want to highlight because it was interesting to see uh, what the contractor decided. This is Hindhead in the UK. This was um, a tunnel, um, road tunnel, where Mott McDonald has made two designs for this tunnel. The first design was option A, you can see here, this was spray concrete, steel fiber reinforced. Then the sheet membrane with the drainage solution and then cast and city concrete as a final lining. The alternative design for this tunnel was a combination between 
spray bar membrane, gas in situ, and sprayed concrete. So here you can see the alternative des design, which is again steel fiber reinforced primary lining, spray bomb, spray applied membrane. Then on the sides, it was cast in situ concrete, and on the crown, it was sprayed concrete. So it was a combination between cast and sprayed as secondary lining. As said in the beginning, um, we have double bonded, and double bonding is also with cast in situ concrete and of course with sprayed concrete. These options were available for the contractor and the contractor had just to decide which kind of design he wanted to make. And at the end, he decided that he will go for option B. Some feedback we got from the contractor about uh, benefits of this composition lining design with the spray bomb membrane. Um, everything was sprayed, so he could use the same team, similar equipment, to spray, spray concrete and the membrane. That saved him around 1.5 million pounds on materials and equipment. And also due to the fact that application of a membrane is very fast and very easy, it, he had some program savings of three to four months. And what is also very important for him, this increased flexibility in application. You don't have to use the scaffolding to install PVCs, you just spray, so it gives him this flexibility. Some pictures about the project, excavation support that probably you know, in the, also in the, in the tunnels. Here you see the application, or let's say the application that has been done with the spray applied waterproofing membrane. So this gives them the flexibility in the application. So you can spray your membrane, you can stop, you can go with the crew to spray concrete, you come back, you clean this area, you make an overlap and you spray again. So it gives the the contract, the complete flexibility in uh, application. This was, of course, also quite some savings. He could use easy formwork to cast the sidewalls and spray application of spray concrete on the top. So he saved also on this equipment for the for the casting. And this is the completed tunnel, nicely built. Conform the latest safety requirements, reflective paint, dark crown, sprayed application, cast in situ. So it really looks nice. And this was constructed in 2011. One of the major products, projects that was done last few years, and probably everybody uh, who's listening now, he knows uh, this project is Crossrail. This is the new Elizabeth line in London. And uh, this was constructed uh, having five major stations and also two large crossover caverns at Fisher Street and Stepney Green. So this was all the stations, all the crossovers were designed with the sprayable membrane. This was a quite complex <clears throat> project for us because it was consisting of a lot of uh, joint ventures with a lot of square meters to be applied. In total areas, if we calculate everything, it was more than 200 square meters of spray or membrane. And you can imagine with this kind of complex geometry, it makes it very tricky and difficult to install PVC sheets. But as I said, one smaller project, and they wanted to have a combination, spray applied membrane with the PVC sheet at the invert with the special design for the connection. Again, some pictures, complex geometry. If you're coming out of a TVM and you have the enlargement, spray bar membrane, you just follow the contours of this enlargement. Cross connections, starter bars, not problem at all. Here you can see the TVM of Crossrail, and here you see a typical application by hand. You need a scaffold, no scaffolding for the cherry picker with a big platform, and you spray uh, the membrane in one go. Another nice reference, a small one, that is on the in the US, wineries. In uh, California, you have a lot of wineries, and they are creating nice uh, wine tasting rooms underground. And of course, these wine tasting rooms has to be attractive and of course dry, because people have to go in and they have to taste the wine. So all these caverns, wine tasting rooms, are uh, waterproofed by using 
Master Yield 3, 4, 5. Also in the US, Deep Rock Pump Station in Indianapolis. Again here, you see typical application of the membrane on the prepared surface. And the last reference I would like to show you is in Singapore, on the other side of the world, where they made an enlargement of the parking station in the Victoria Theatre in Singapore. And here you can see on this side, you can see the uh, diaphragm walls, the piles, which of course are not that attractive to spray a membrane on. So they had to be regulated with the concrete to make it uh, approvable for the membrane. You see a lot of starter bars, but by spraying the membrane doesn't make any problem for the waterproof system. So that's all roughly a few references to give you a flavor about what we have done in the over the years. Um, we try to inform you about the different design possibilities, uh, what is possible with a sprayable membrane by replacing the sheet membranes with the sprayable membrane or even incorporate permanent spraying concrete but the main topic of today is to give you an idea about how can I make a composite and reduce the total line of thickness. And as Claire said, if we make the calculation by using the laminate glass theory, we are ending up with around 20 to 30 percent lining reduction. And this lining reduction is essential for a cost efficient tunnel design. Because we can create some savings. And just to give you um, a quick overview about an example. An example about 20% um, lining with the reduction. So if you take a double shell lining, internal diameter of 10 meter, if you are a designer, you can calculate your primary lining around 200 millimeter. Then you have your waterproofing system, which consists of geotextile and PVC, two millimeter, and then you have your secondary lining. So this is a typical double shell lining, which is which you, you can calculate traditionally. Every designer can calculate the double shell uh, design. Now we are going into um, lining optimization. So lining reduction up to 20%. So we stay with the same internal diameter. We stay with the same 200 millimeter of permanent spray concrete lining as primary lining. We have 3 kg or 3.5 kg of mass seal 345. And then we have, instead of 300 millimeter cast and city concrete, we have 200 millimeter of permanent spray concrete lining. That means 20% total lining reduction from 500 to 400. That means the external diameter of this tunnel is only 10.8 meter. If we calculate then the material savings on concrete, and on waterproof systems. Concrete for the primary lining, 6,700. Secondary lining, 9,700. In total, almost 17,000 square meter, uh, cubic meter for concrete for one kilometer tunnel. If we take the composite, we only need 13,000 cubic meter of concrete. That means 21% savings in only material. And if you calculate the CO2 reduction, we can already have 9% CO2 reduction based on the material savings, because mainly we save concrete, cement. 21% reduction in concrete use. This is only for material. Additional savings is um, speed, of, uh, speed of excavation, less material uh, to transport, less material to dispose, uh, faster uh, tunnel advance. So there's a lot more about the savings that you can have here. Also, formwork for your inner lining, you can avoid with composition lining. So this material savings is only 21%, but you save at the end, you save more. What we have available for designers is the so-called handbook for composition lining design. And in this handbook, we, we explain everything that you have seen today. So we have the first chapter, which is covering uh, all the properties and application of the membrane, that which was covered by Diletta. Then we have the design related chapter, 
what is the inter interface properties, how does this laminate glass theory work, and how do you have to calculate that? That's all explained in this paragraph. And then, of course, we have some uh, references and some conclusions and um, reports mentioned in this handbook. This handbook can be downloaded if you go to this landing page. But also, uh, additional, um, additionally to that, we can also do some additional testing for specific projects if you need some data that is not covered with the handbook. So as a summary, to end this, um, this webinar, Mars Seal 3 for 5 spray applied waterproof membrane can be used in different design options. You can have a drain tunnel, a tank tunnel, or a combination of, of, uh, of those. You can combine it with PVC sheet if you have the right uh, connection detail. And we have a proven track record of this product all over the globe. We have sold it from Australia to North America to South America. It has some unique advantages. There's this watertight system for minimal maintenance cost. Um, due to the double bonding properties, you don't have any water migration on the interfaces, so you reduce your maintenance cost. And we have this load sharing between the primary and secondary lining, which allows you this optimization of the lining thickness. Again, we have a handbook available to help you to go through this process, which is available for you to, uh, to get. These are the contacts. This is the landing page for the handbook. Email addresses from Diletta, email address from, from Claire or from her boss, Mr. Jung. So if you need additional questions about the products or design, or you want to um, get a copy of the handbook, you can register on this landing page of the handbook. That's my last slide. Now I think we can go to the To the questions. Uh, Diletta and Claire, can you join quickly on this one? Let me see. Yes. If, you, if everybody's going to the meeting chat, you can see um, the questions. Okay, the first the first question was uh, thickness recommendation for double track railway tunnel and any international codes for this to follow. Is that uh, thickness of master seal or lining thickness? I think this is, uh, is asked for the lining thickness reductions. So um, what we try to uh, come across on this design issue is that you start as a designer on your double shell lining, where you calculate the, the primary lining and you calculate your secondary lining. And then you're using the laminate glass theory to estimate your lining reduction. So it is, we don't have any recommended thickness uh, for a double track railway tunnel. It's depending on the situation in the country and also on the on the soil and rock conditions. But we use this laminate glass theory to make an estimation about lining reduction. Uh, Frank, I think uh, um, yeah, the, the thickness was related to mainly to the waterproofing to the membrane because the um, ah okay yeah yeah the, uh, so we can say actually we suggest uh, um, uh, three millimeters of the membrane but take into account that uh, the importance is to get a continuous membrane because it is also related to get a continuous membrane the consumption of the membrane and the millimeters of the membrane are related to the roughness uh, when we have uh, a higher roughness, uh, we have to uh, create a thick membrane to get uh, two, three millimeters of continuous membrane. Uh, when we have uh, an optimum roughness, as for uh, um, as when we use, for example, a regulating layer, as 
Frank showed in the video, and as also uh, Claire um, talked about that uh, in her presentation, we will have uh, an optimum uh, roughness. So in that case, uh, um, with the minimum consumption, we will get the suggested thickness of 3 millimeters, continuous membrane. But the importance is to get a continuous membrane. Uh, the thickness can vary. Uh, and about requirements, and we 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 have uh, no. You can find an Itatech guideline about uh, spray ball spray applied membranes um, uh, from 2013, but it will be updated uh, in next uh, months. Uh, and there you can find um, the recommended uh, recommended uh, yeah procedure. And we have also a method statement you can get from us and our technical brochure. Frank, I don't know if you want to add no, something. That's, no, that's fine. Let's say everything is, is covered with documents, so uh, is available. Um, Frank, the minimum thickness, uh, sorry to disturb, the minimum th uh, thickness, what is recommended is 3 mm. No, the, let's say the, we we guarantee a water tightness of two millimeter, but in reality, mm -hmm. because you have you have some some uh, roughness, uh, you your average spraying application is three millimeter. Are we are we supposed to check in the DFT at certain places? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to check. Uh, you have to check manually the thickness of the membrane. Okay. Thanks. Sir. Yeah. Uh, then we have something, a question about cost. That is very difficult uh, for me to uh, to comment on uh, because this is really depending on the type of the tunnel. Uh, but we, but what we have seen um, is that um, the application of the membrane compared to PVC is in the same ballpark. So it's not a huge um, uh, difference yeah. if you take everything into account. Well, of course, with PVC, you have to do this compart compartments. You have to install this uh, injection flanges. Uh, you have to um, install probably also a, a protection layer. So if you take everything in, into account, it is in the same area of application. The only the only thing that is that you can have is if you, if you have the composite shell lining, you would use and you. Yeah, yeah, um, a lot of secondary lining. There's a. Arey, I never done that, yar. Please be more. So, so if you take the composition lining into account, then of course you save more than uh, than you can do with uh, uh, with a double sheet, with a double sheet membranes. And then we have another question about uh, what's the projected life for the Marshall three four five. Um, this is uh, the product is compared is lifetime is comparable with PVC. So if you have um, a PVC sheet in the in the soil, it will not never uh, uh, degrade. If you put a piece of mass seal 345 into the soil, it will never degrade. So it's a very durable polymer which is not decomposed uh, for uh, years. So we normally gave um, if an applicator has to give a guarantee about the application. Which is roughly around 20 years or 25 years in some uh, some areas. We can easily match the lifetime of the Marshall 345 with this one. This one. Another question is about waterproofing thickness. Waterproofing thickness, as said, we guarantee the same as PVC. If you have two millimeter as a minimum dry film thickness, it's waterproof. This test that Diletta has showed you with this 20 bar water pressure was done on a two millimeter thick. Membrane. You want something to add on that one, the letter? No, that's okay. No. Yeah. No, and I think it's re requirements. Sorry. Requirements for surface. Yeah. Uh, available in the method statement, we can uh, we can share actually the method statement. Yeah. So we have we have a, a simple tool to measure the the roughness of the surface. And we have some recommendations on the surface roughness. Roughness doesn't mean an undulation, eh? so it can the surface can be undulated heavily, but is is the small 
uh, surface roughness that you have with sprayed concrete. And if it's exceeding a certain value, then we recommend to spray the smoothen layer. It's a very easy, simple um, device that you can use to check. But I cannot go into detail, I cannot show you at the moment, but uh, that's all measured, uh, mentioned in our meta statement. Then you um, have some I'm yeah, if you want, uh, Frank, so you can have a look to the next uh, yeah. questions. Uh, while spraying the waterproofing it must be affecting the health of the operator, how safe the spray operation is. Um, it is um, it, the health of the operator is uh, uh, not affected from from the membrane, but of course uh, the operator has to use all DPI, so mask, uh, um, uh, glass, and a helmet, and and gloves also. But it is not cor a, a corrosive material or something like that. It is not a dangerous material, but um yeah Frank, same, same, yeah, yeah. So same pre same pre precautions if you if you're spraying uh, sprayed concrete if you have sprayed concrete you have to do also some protection with the marcial 345 the same protection applies yeah because because it is uh, actually in powder no? at the beginning yeah. Uh, cost details you want, you re replied already? Yeah, cost, cost details, if you really want to have a, a detailed cost, some information about cost, I have to refer to Naresh, who can give you the local uh, um, information. Yeah, I will share, if somebody will ask me, Frank. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Then, um, maximum load of secondary lining, Mars 345 can take. Uh, that's something I cannot answer. That's something maybe Claire can make some comment on that one. Yeah, I mean, I would say there's not a there's not a number that we can provide. Um, I would say that the primary and secondary lining are working with the master seal as one composite structure. So there's no kind of uh, impact on the secondary lining uh, or limit to the secondary lining. Um, limit that's linked to master seal 345 i don't believe it's a, a limit on the design condition um so i would say there's there's not a value for that really they work together uh mr kailash has also raised the hand he also want to ask i think the question mr kailash Ambedkar. yeah hi uh, good afternoon uh, uh good evening i just want to know that uh, when you apply this spray applied liquid coating, if the surface is wet or it is seepage, what kind of uh, treatment, how we will treat this, uh, how we apply this spray applied in the in this area, the, if the water flow is high and all these things? Okay, that's maybe something I can, can answer. Uh, that is depending on the design of your tunnel. If you have a, a drained tunnel design, then you can easily drain it down to the invert, as you have seen in the animation from the letter. If you have an undrained uh, tunnel, uh, then the, you have to do, if you have huge water ingress, you have to do some injection to uh, minimize the water ingress, or you do some release packers. So that's also a possibility. So if you would request our meta statement, uh, there we explain all the three different types of uh, dealing with water. So it's really depending on the on the way of you have you design in your, your tunnel design done. Okay, thank you. Yeah, then we have something about, about equipment. Uh, you saw the equipment in the video. So normally we use the dry spray equipment, um, which is able to spray low quantities. Uh, low quantities means that you spray roughly 0 0.4, 0 0.5 cubic meter per hour. So of course you have to spray only this three millimeter in one pass. So very low output uh, without any major pulsation that is needed. Uh, for that you can use the, the the pump that I showed you in the video, the reed reed pump. They have a configuration that is able to do that, but also the Mako Picola is able to do that. But also is essential is the the nozzle tip. That is a special design nozzle tip. Yeah, you meant to say that this, if the surface is minor weight, we can apply this direct uh, this coat, uh, coating on the surface. Say, say again, sorry, didn't, didn't hear you. Yeah, 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 I'm just saying that if the surface is wet, minor weight, you can say the moisturized weight surface, 
So yeah, you can moist, apply this coating. Yeah, moisturize wet is uh, if it's moist, it's not a problem. Because let's say uh, even in uh, for, before the application, we have to pre-wet the surface anyway. So if the surface is moist, we can apply the mass seal three four five without any problem. Then we have a question about uh, what will be effect of a fire in case of takes place wide operation. This product is self extinguishing, so it it will not propagate the fire. So if you, if you put a torch on the product, it will not burn. So there's no uh, danger for um, a fire or fire propagation during construction. Uh, Mr. Shankar has also raised the hand. He also want to ask some question. OK, yes. Uh, Mr. Shankar. May I know the crack bridging capacity of the membrane and what will be the thickness need to consider? So yeah, we, we can. We, oh, okay, yeah. let's, let, me, let, me, let me first answer, then Dilata can jump in if she wants. Yeah. Um, let's say we have an um, um, elasticity of the product around 100%. That means if you test it according to the norms, um, we require a crack bridging property of two and a half millimeter. That's uh, that is established. So that's the uh, the crack bridging that we can guarantee. That doesn't mean that. Um, let's let's put it the other way. If you have cracks of two and a half millimeter in your structure, you have another problem. You don't have a waterproofing problem anymore. You have a, maybe a structural problem on that one. So in in most cases, this crack bridging. Um, uh, capability is more than enough to cope with all the small cracks that you can have. Let's say if you have cracks in concrete, you, we are talking about 0 0.2, 0 0.5, maybe 0 0.8 millimeter. So in that case, a two to three millimeter mass seal is can easily uh, bridge these cracks without having uh, waterproofing problems. Then we, we, have we have some questions about the water requirements for the paste of polymer. Um, we recommend to spray around with 50 to 60 percent of water. That's the quantity that we normally use. This is depending a little bit on the environment and also on the layer thickness that you want to, want to spray. Um, you can go higher to, to 65 or 70 percent without any problem because uh, the product will, will get more fluid, but it will have the same properties at the end. You, you, don't, you don't have to compare this with the cementitious material. This is a polymer base, so more water doesn't change the properties a lot. Only if you have too less water, you can have some problems. Uh, question two is again about the surface uh, application, surface preparation. Um, yeah, again, the method statement. Please ask for a method statement that we will um, send to you, and you can find all mainly on uh, answers to your question about application and related to uh, water management. So basically, basically for the surface, if we talk about application, uh, surface preparation is, um, shot, you have your sprayed concrete, then you apply your smoothing layer to make it smooth. Before you apply the master seal 345, you clean the surface and you pre-wet the surface, and then you apply the master seal 345. If the master seal 345 has been cured, you clean the mass seal 345 and you spray or cast your second lining. That is the main sequence. Then we have a question for Claire. Yeah, I was just having a look at that, Frank. I think it's sort of similar to what you just described, um, sort of dust between the layers and an application of the layers on the lab test. Um, test panels. I think we we would have followed the same method statement that's proposed for uh, application on site. So it's cleaned and prepared as per um, it would be on site. Um, so we didn't see an effect to the bond strength. And I think the bond strength value that um, Deletta reported as the 1.2 MPA is the average across um, many 
bond strength tests um, that are all prepared in the same way. Uh, and then question four, um, I can show the slide quickly if I share my screen. Um, I'm assuming it's this one here about shear modulus, if I'm correct. Um, so for the shear modulus, this was taken um, from each of the core tests. So the shear modulus value was assessed from each of the cores by looking at um, the, the degree of shear deformation um, on each of the core tests, and that was measured. We plotted out the results, and basically we had, for example, here we had 17 cores where we had a low 2.5 to 5 MPA value measured um, and so forth. In order to avoid some of these very high um, sort of single 22 to 25 type MPA values, we took, uh, for our modeling, we took these out of the data set above 15 and we averaged the shear modulus values that were below 15, so an average of all of these values, which gave uh, a G of 7 MPA. So that was our, our test, but we have varied the, the shear modulus um, in, in a couple of the assessments, like in the design chart, we did a variation to see the impact. So that's the way that that was done. I hope that answers the question. Okay, then we have a question about uh, what are the criteria basis uh, for the lining type, uh, spray concrete lining or casted uh, lining. Um, that's depending a little bit on in, uh, from the countries. Um, in a lot of countries, you have road tunnels where they want to have a nice uh, surface finishing and then they go for uh, casted lining. But um, even in Scandinavia, you have uh, road tunnels that are completely made with uh, spray concrete lining. Um, so there's no criteria. It's just how how should the surface look like. You saw my um, example from Heintet. That was a road tunnel where they um, went for the casted uh, sidewalls and sprayed concrete uh, on the crown because it was a road tunnel and it was needed to have a nice surface with a reflective paint on it. So there's no real criteria what to, what to use. Uh, Frank, there is also uh, before this one a uh, question about uh, the, how much water is required for mixing ah. or spraying. Um, you can see again in the method statement or in the TD in the technical data sheet, but we usually are in the range 40 um, 60 percent uh, um, of the um, weight of the uh, membrane used. Um, take into account where we uh, carry out tests in the lab uh, and we have to mix by hand the membrane, we usually use the 50%, um, more or less. But even if you will use uh, um, um, a, a higher value of uh, uh, a higher quantity of water, uh, the membrane will take uh, um, more time to uh, to, to cure, but it will not be actually affected from the water. And then we have a question about the dry film thickness. Um, let's say if if we talk about thickness of the of the, of the wet sprayed membrane and the dry film thickness, let's say during spraying you measure already the the thickness due after just after spraying. That's point number one. If you want to check afterwards after cure and the dry film thickness, you have to you have to make a cut. Uh, you have to, to cut it, uh, you take a small piece out and you measure the thickness uh, with, uh, with measure, measuring tape. Um, that's the only way afterwards. There's no instrument to do that, uh, uh, like, like with uh, epoxy paints on cars where you can measure the uh, dry film thickness automatically. Just not in this case. You really have to cut it out and then you have to repair it by uh, taking a little bit of moss seal, mix it with water, take a brush and uh, repaint it. Then we have again a question about uh, on wet and dripping conditions. Wet, as I said, wet conditions is not a problem. Dripping conditions is depending on how much drips you have, but normally we say 
put something release packets in there or divert it to, to the invert if you have a drain system that will deal with the water. Then we have a question about uh, our presentations. They are already been sent to the organizer and I think they will be distributed later on. Um, then I have a last question that is on the on the line. Uh, has it been done in India? Uh, and if yes, please share the project details. We have done projects in India and now I have to refer to Naresh because he has the names. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, recently, we have completed one project near Manali. This is a Rotang tunnel. If you are having any question, if anybody want to know about, more about this, he can write down me a mail or he can call me on 9818885868 or otherwise he can write down to CBIP. I can share that detail with the CBIP organizers. Nareji, can you please again share your uh, number with, with us? Uh, sir, 988 Nareji, yeah. it will be helpful if you can uh, share the method statement as well. Yeah, sure. You please uh, uh, give me a call. I will send you the my uh, mail ID. Mail ID and then sure, we will sure. exchange. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, I think we went through all the questions at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Sir. So now the question. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Now the question. Now the question session is over. We are thankful to the speakers for today's virtual session and look forward to their support in future too. I thank all the people who were part participant for this program to, to be associated with the coming association of India. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank and you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.